Date point. Eighth month. BV. In orbit around perfection. Dear journal, I can count cards. Okay, not really. But I can still beat the house at their own game. So, you know, basically counting cards. What part of contact me the moment you've completed the task confused you? Vakno, scowling mug, stared up at me from the view screen. I thought a moment. Probably the part where you assumed I would willingly contact you. Come on, Vakno, I'm sorry, it just slipped my mind. You had to have learned about it pretty quick, though, right? I mean, he's an informant. It's his job to inform you. So I figured he'd get in touch with you on his own soon enough. She glared back. While you're not technically wrong, I usually appreciate knowing someone is in my employ before receiving information from them. She huffed. I'll let it go, like I have with so many of your other shortcomings, and explain why you received my message asking to speak to you. I'm all ears. I took a moment to check behind myself to ensure Iava was still out of sight, behind the doorframe. Until recently, my services were employed by a reasonably affluent client who desired information pertinent to their business and future financial success. Her tone and words led me to grimace. I'm assuming that, until recently, are the key words in this instance. Yes, she snapped. Don't interrupt, I say. Until recently, because it came to my attention that he had implied in certain circles of knowledgeable individuals that his success was entirely due to his genius, in no part because of the excellent services rendered by myself. While I would never expect him to make his dealings with me common knowledge, the particular beings with whom he voices incorrect opinions are potential future or current clients and therefore already aware through deduction that he and I have had several business encounters. There's a lot of words in there, my drawled. Mind shortening it up for me? My tone seemed to annoy her even more, or maybe it was the interrupting part. In summary, she growled through gritted teeth, my reputation has been impinged upon before people whose opinion I value, and therefore I feel a public example is in order to discourage similarly unfortunate occurrences. Gossip, I stretched, sitting up from the slouch I'd adopted for the conversation. Who do I have to intimidate? You misunderstand. She had a thin-lipped smile. I don't just want him subdued, I want him ruined. She spat the last word like it was vinegar. If he were as intelligent as he claims, then he would have realised cutting me, one now intimately familiar with his business's inner workings, out of my fair share of the credit was not an action conductive to his continued good fortune. I was thinking something along the same lines. Yeah, about that. I thought you said your clients were usually part of the smarter bunch. I know Einstein, and even I know not to cross you for something as minor as an ego boost. Her eyes took on something of a haunted look. Most are. Although there are some who I only accept because no one that dull should ever possess so much personal wealth. As my unfortunate ex-client, he may be suffering under the impression that his particular branch of business is untouchable by someone such as myself. I believe even you yourself once voiced the opinion that I could not affect events, only know of them. I struggled to keep myself from shifting uncomfortably. He must learn that I do not bluff, she finished with another glare. Although this one, I was happy to notice, didn't seem to be directed at anyone in the current conversation. Great, right, so what do you want me to do? Remember, I'm not so hot on the whole killing people thing these days. She didn't look convinced, but didn't ask as she continued. Then you're fortunate that I specifically do not want you to kill anyone, although I do need you to get into a fight. I'm going to need a little more than that. The ex-client is a Cheshnash by the name of Duheshni. While he does have several fledgling business ventures, his primary source of income stems from training, entering and betting upon contestants in Torzo matches. I shook my head. Yeah, gonna ask you to fill me in on that last part. She sighed in a way that told me she had expected as much. Many of the upper echelons of certain societies find their life to be dull and unfulfilling, and so find their excitement by watching and betting on strength and endurance matches between contestants specifically trained for such exercises. She correctly interpreted my blank look. Prize fights, she said wearily. They watch prize fights. Huh. I wasn't faking the surprise in my voice. I hadn't figured anyone out here would have the stomach for stuff like that. Believe me, she replied dryly. I'm somewhat aware of humanity's idea of spectator fights, and what you're thinking is probably wrong. These are fights started by bored corporate owners from species known for their somewhat aggressive natures. Her tone made her opinion of such actions clear. You'd never find a courtier involved in these affairs. 
I shrugged. Hey, I'm not judging. I totally was. You still haven't gone to the part where I come in. Through my exemplary abilities, I was able to direct Jusheshni to several individuals with excellent potential for torso matches. One of those individuals, a rather eccentric locale called Uxir, turned out even better than my own protections, and has placed Jusheshni at the top of nearly every circle. Shortly a tournament match will be conducted in perhaps the most influential and most public torso ring. Joheshti has made it very clear that he intends to dominate this match with Uxir, and has put no small amount of his personal wealth on the line. Personally, I believe he was overly cautious with his estimates, but that won't matter. I want you to enter that tournament, reach the finals, and crush Joheshti's reputation as a trainer by defeating Uxir in as humiliating a way as possible. I'll leave the choice of methodology up to you. Dang, Vakno, you don't do a thing half assed when you want to send a message. So how do I get into this match? I have assembled the correct credentials, identifications, and references. Correct? She gave another one of those weird, thin-lipped smiles. What good is ruining him if it's not clear who's doing it? The information you'll be using doesn't name me directly, but anyone who looks will clearly see my influence. Now, as I said, I've assembled all the necessary information. All you need is a handler. It doesn't matter who, just get someone reliable who can hand a data chip to a bouncer and keep their mouth shut. If you have absolutely no friends, as I'm worried might be the case, a handler can also be provided. Rather than rising to the bait, I thought a moment. Could Yava be trusted? It's been, what, eight months since the medical station? Not much had happened since then. After all my apologies, we'd been sightseeing, going places I'd heard about while in the army. For a while, she'd seemed subdued, but recently I'd really enjoyed her company. It was nice to have someone to talk to. Was it time to let her try being around other people again? Eight months is a long time. Odd, it didn't seem like it. That's because you're turning into an old fart who reminisces about the good old days. What are you talking about? I'm not even... Holy shit. Yeah, haven't thought about that lately, have you? Not listening, I'm not listening. I'm still young and full of energy, and I think Yava's ready to go out in public again. You can't avoid time, you know. I ignored the lies by answering Vakno. No worries, I've got someone. I stopped my time out her because I'm young and full of life and had just proven that I had friends. So, you're going to send the information my way or what? My communication beeped as the transmission was received. I couldn't help but smile as the thought occurred. This is your last one, Vakno. After this, I'm free of you. Oh, that reminds me, she said in the tone that made it clear she's forgotten nothing. So you're aware, should you ever be in need of difficult to obtain information, I'd be happy to take your calls any time at the usual rates. I laughed to show her how youthful I was. Ha, <laughs> I'd rather space myself than willingly come back to you for help. Nice try, but after this I'm blaming on never seeing you again. As you wish. Was that smugness on her face? Please, though, do contact me the moment it's finished. Oh, and one final thing. Not that this will happen, but if by some incredible happenstance you manage to lose the fight with Uxir, I will personally rip your throat out. Are we clear? Yup. I tried to sound as cheerful as I could. Hope you die, later. I cut the channel, opened the information package, and set the ship on course to the supply destination. I turned as Yava hopped out from behind the doorframe. Assessment? Huh? Last time you listened in on a conversation between me and Vagner, you had some guesses as to her motivations that honestly helped a lot when going about the job. So you have any this time? Oh, uh, well, there was that one part where she said she doesn't bluff. That could be referring to what you did last time. She basically declared to anyone watching that crossing her could mean getting a visit from you. This Jushni either wasn't watching or thinks she's lying, but either way, if she doesn't come through with her implied threat, then she'll probably lose a lot of influence and respect since people will stop taking her seriously. I nodded, impressed. Makes sense to me. And another thing, doesn't this task seem a little... trivial? Not really. I mean, who else could she send and feel so sure they'd win? Not that... The way she wants you to do it is obviously tailored, but I feel this guy just isn't important enough to warrant such a response. I mean, a reasonably wealthy individual who's the current favourite for a semi-underground prize fighting club? Why make an example out of him? Why not wait until someone important remains? Regardless of whether or not she's making good on a previous threat, I'm always certain she could exact some retribution on him that didn't use up her last big favour. It's like she's just throwing it away. Maybe. What's your point? I think she doesn't see it as her last favour from you. Whoa, hold up there. After this I'm done. I'm not going back to her. 
She has to have noticed that I don't enjoy being a reverend boy. Why would she think I'd come back? Probably because she thinks she won't have a choice. Well, that's... unsettling. She whipped it off with her tail. It's just speculation. Now, unless you know someone who's not terrified or angry at you, it sounded as though I might be joining you for this trip. Yup, I nodded simply. Think you're up for it? Yes, she replied seriously. Where are we headed? I looked back at the destination, then did a double take and looked more closely. I'd assumed it would be another trading station or a shipyard, maybe some influential planet. My curiosity peaked when its designator classified it as a ship. Apparently, I said after a while, we're headed for some kind of pleasure cruiser called the Hedonist. Is it special? Don't know, never heard of it. I haven't really come across any pleasure cruises in my time out here, though, so... maybe? Great, how long? Couple days. I'll get the chessboard. Two days later. Hedonist. Holy fuck, that's big. Iava looked similarly shocked, not even bothering to confirm my obvious statement. Big didn't really do it justice. This thing was a whale. Nearly a kilometre in length and 200 metres high and wide. The kinetic drives alone dwarf my entire ship, requiring so much energy they hummed with incredible power. Had my ship not literally provided me with the hedonist dimensions, I would have overestimated on every count. Its shape amplified the effect. Its hull being nothing more than a dome, cut off obliquely at the back to make room for kinetics. Its underside slightly rounded. If I were completely honest, it was rather ugly. The reasons behind its simple shape became abundantly clear the moment the stupefying effect of its size wore off. I had seen battleships and dreadnoughts from both sides in the current conflict. This ship put every one of them to shame. It looked like someone had crossbred a hedgehog with an armadillo and then designed a ship from the offspring. Rows upon rows of turrets lined every inch of the outer hull, sprouting from it like so many spines. Beneath this intimidating display of offensive power, light glinted dully, reflecting of layers of thick, interlocking armour plates. The underside of the ship was similarly outfitted. The ship affronted its armaments, excellent firing arcs, while providing nothing in the way of vulnerabilities to potential enemies. My starting spree didn't stop once I got inside the ship. If anything, it became a rampage, and I hadn't even yet left the docking bay. Every docking bay I've been in to date had looked like an unfinished basement, walls a dull grey and covered in pipes and shit. I just assumed that's how they had to be. It wasn't really a choice. Hedonist opened my eyes to the wondrous world of designer docking bays. Off white light streamed from dozens of sources, challenging the single source harshness of its inferior contemporaries. Walls free of clutter gleamed with a shine chrome wished it could match, and the smooth, dark floors. Free of any scratch despite the numerous ships that must have landed on them, reflected my smiling face like a black pool. The only control console in the room was ergonomically built into the far wall, detracting nothing. I was so mesmerised by the wondrous vision before me that I didn't notice the other guy in the room until he made a quiet sound. Turning, I started at the strikingly familiar figure standing quietly behind me. I'd never seen this person before. Honestly, I don't think I'd ever really seen his species up close, but what struck me was how similar to a human he looked. I mean, the guy was about three times my height and so thin I was scared I'd blow him over. I say him, but I honestly couldn't have told you either way for two reasons. Firstly, if it was a guy, then he had the most feminine features I'd seen on a male member of a species I'd ever seen. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Obviously, and secondly, he was wearing clothes. Like, actual, real clothes. Not the tall harnesses that seemed the height of fashion with everyone working on the station. This guy's style probably could have rocked it at any fashion show back on Earth and taken first prize every time, or whatever they do at fashion shows. I mean, I wouldn't have wanted to wear their suit, but he pulled it off flawlessly. Iava apparently hadn't noticed him either, and looked somewhat taken aback by our guest's impressive stature. My initial surprise gone, I immediately noticed that when he spoke, he didn't do so to me, but to Iava instead. Welcome, Madam to Hedonist. I am Dacina Tis, your personal attendant for this evening. Judging by her lack of a response, Iava didn't have one. I, on the other hand, opened my mouth immediately. Being able to say something at any given time is kind of a talent of mine. Wait, does everyone get a personal assistant here? That's got to be insanely hard to coordinate. The glance he gave me was perfectly proper, but somehow I still got the impression he was annoyed by my question. Of course not. 
Only guests of import receive such treatment. Now it was the Alva's turn to mind vomit. Although she still phrased her question in a way that seemed to meet the scene's approval. Why would you believe us to be such guests? Once again, his expression didn't perceptibly change, but I felt as though his words were smug, bordering and patronising. The identification information you transmitted upon arrival, while not overly obvious, was subtly so, and led us to believe your employer did not feel it necessary for her connection to you remain unacknowledged by Hedonist. His eyes narrowed slightly. If we were mistaken, however... Iava said, Of course not, just as I replied, Yes. After aiming at a calculating glass by way, he seemed to decide that Iava's opinion was the one that mattered. Turning to her directly, he gave a bow that did nothing to reduce his prestigious height. Excellent, then if you will follow me, I shall show you to your room and, if you desire, guide you through the various entertainment options Hedonist has to offer. She didn't even look at me to confirm whatever decision she'd made. If she had, she would have seen me furiously shaking my head, which, to the careful observer, would have informed her that we did not want his help beyond showing us to the rooms. Stickman and the Rat. Mature. We're nearly out of the docking bay before they even noticed that I wasn't following. You coming? I glared at her. Oh, don't pout. I could tell she was struggling not to smile behind that look of mock pity. It's only natural he'd assume I'm in charge. Smarter, fitter and better looking. What else would he think? Ha, <laughs> shut up. At the deepening my glare at her, I followed a moment later. Fine, but there better be snacks. After a long hallway leading away from the exquisite docking bays, we reached a glass door that opened onto perhaps the most decadent game floor I'd ever seen. I never really thought the people out here to be the best when it came to interior decorating, but I instantly revised that sentiment upon the evidence before me. If Siegfried and Roy had a threesome with a unicorn, the result couldn't have matched this place with glamour. Reds, silvers, golds and blacks melded and highlighted each other in such a way as to emphasise the fact that I was too poor to look at them, and this room in general, let alone stand it in. Lights from hundreds of tables glow softly all around, their various hues somehow complementing the surroundings. A sound beside me tore me from my reverie. Neat. I looked down at the artistic ingrate. Neat? You're confronted by a room that probably took more money and resources than it would take to terraform a planet, and all you have to say is, neat? She shrugged. Yeah, it looks expensive, so what? Anyone can spend money. I was more impressed by the exterior. That at least looked practical. Believe me, if you'd seen some of the things rich people do with their money back on Earth, you'd realise that just because you spend a fortune doesn't mean it looks good. Stigman cleared his throat, gesturing onwards questioningly once our attention had been recaptured. So, once we've seen the rooms, are we going straight to business or will we have time for a few games? The other whispered, as we once again followed our stone-faced attendant. Wait, you're asking my opinion? Aren't you in charge being better and all that? Well, of course, she cooed. But I want you to know that I value your input. Oh, your our guest knows no bounds. I know. You sure you don't want to go find something practical to do with your time? I appreciate something's appearance by how well it works. That doesn't mean I'm a total bore. We playing something or what? We got some time before we have to check in. We can't let Stigman show us around, but I can say for a fact that we're not playing any of these games. Because? I gave a huff. This place is a casino. You've been in one of those? I've diced. Is that the same thing? Pretty much. These out here are the luck-based games. Or at least I'm guessing. I don't really recognise any of them, but if I know one thing is that I'll never play again with my luck. Things will probably go down so poorly I somehow managed to blow up the entire ship. You're kind of paranoid, you know that? She's right, you know. Besides, this is a pleasure cruiser. Maybe they have some games based on something other than luck. I guarantee you that if we find something requiring physical skill, then we can make some easy money before we have to do anything boring for Vacano. You realise you just described a prize fight as boring, right? That thing you just thought about saying? Don't. That's not appropriate. True. Different tack. With the kind of fight these guys have, I guarantee you it'll be boring. Our rooms were, if possible, more decadent than the magnificent gaming room below. Wood panelling and shining stone floors left me nervous to even step on them, lest I scuff their perfect sheen. I think Stickman had noticed our lack of bags and rushed us out of the room almost as soon as we'd arrived. The first thing on the tour he showed us was what we'd already seen. Rows upon rows of games I had no idea how to play and no desire to learn. The true size of the ship finally set in when he took us outside the building that we had 
apparently been in since our arrival. A massive portion of the ship was, in fact, empty space, creating a vaulting ceiling under which sprawled an incredible artificial garden. More tables and games were interspersed throughout the area, large and small buildings occupying crossroads and lined up all along the sides. That hint of smugness was back in Stickman's eyes. After what felt like an hour of his showing us various games that didn't meet with our, your, approval, he showed us to a row of machines that looked more than a little familiar. At a glance I thought they were exact replicas of Skee-Ball, a closer inspection showed the ludicrous differences that had me laughing at the sight of them. The ramp had been replaced by a simple barrier, ensuring the player remained the correct distance from the target holes, unless I'm informed otherwise, that's their official name. The glass had also been removed, allowing straight shots. It was almost a simple hoops game, except for the rings of targets indicating more or fewer points respectively. Oh, and they were slowly rotating about the centre, whose target had been removed. If there had been all the changes, I frankly would have thought it would be harder to play, until I saw what I was throwing. Hacky Sacks Honest to God, hacky sacks. I could tell Yava and Sigmund were confused by my son Murph, but I couldn't help it. So, have we finally found a game that met with your approval? Yava asked when I stopped to catch my breath. Yes, I heaved. There's no power in hell strong enough to keep me from trying this. Great, she squealed, hopping happily to the edge of the barrier. Sigmund explained the rules, and they were exactly what I had expected. Get the hacky sack in a hole and get that many points. Holes worth more points spun quicker, although to me they still seemed on the slow side. Spend points to get more hacky sacks. Spend a small sum to get the initial set and turn in your points at the end to get real money in return. Stickman hit a few buttons on something on his wrist and, per my request, two sets of five sacks were deposited into trays next to two side-by-side -side ski sack machines. As I walked to my machine right next to Iyava's, she looked at me in question. I thought you said you were broke. Where'd you get the money? I assume... I smiled. From Vacno. Won't that technically put you in her debt? I'm sure I'll be able to pay her back with more than enough interest that she won't mind at all. With that, I executed a perfectly underhand throw born of many a hacky sack game, sinking my first shot into the highest point value, in and of itself capable of supplying me with another five sacks. Not bad, the other remarked with a grin. So you're just going to let me win or what? I summed my second shot. I wouldn't say that, she smiled wider. Then leaping into the air, she executed a somersault, holding a sack in her tail. Whipping it around in the same way she would have thrown a javelin, the sack rocketed into the highest value target. The force of the shot shook the entire machine, and it even managed to get the first reaction out of Stigman, as he involuntarily flinched with the pain sounds emanating from Yava's victim. Well, shit. So, you just going to let me win or what? She remarked, as she sucked the landing from her aerial assault on her ski sack machine, picked up another, and leaped back into the air. What followed was perhaps the most intense hacky sack based competition of my life. Stickman's already enormous eyes grew steadily large as we lobbed, well, I lobbed, Yava hurled, shot after shot into what had become the only acceptable target to aim for. I think it was the hollow booms made by Yava's machine every time she landed the shot that drew the crowd. It was certainly loud enough. Things looked grim right from the beginning. I mean, I'm good, but I'm not perfect. I miss, I'm human, it happens to everyone. Except apparently the amazing flying rodent beside me sinking three pointers all her night long. They were more like ten pointers, but you get my drift. She didn't miss a one, and a little crowd of lackeys kept cheering her on, and making me all flustered. Probably because they'd all placed bets on her winning, which was also why my group was rather subdued. But it was their fault for betting on the guy that couldn't jump several times his own height straight up. Okay, so look. I know the official record will show you that he either had the technically higher score when all was said and done, but I would like it to be known that I think she called it off because she saw that I was catching up. She was always ahead. She could have called it off at literally any time and she would have won. Sure, fine, she had a good start, but I was getting on her. No, you weren't. Why must you speak when no one is talking to you? Wait, are you serious? The result of the match was Yava managing to permanently affix a smug grin to her face, while I was even more determined to find a game I could beat her at. And I got my chance several minutes later when Stickman, now putting a bit more distance between himself and Yava than he had before, showed us to another pavilion with another, vaguely familiar game. I'd never played it before, but the closest comparison I could give it would be Pachinko. The key differences were while I still had a pool of balls to drop on, only one was launched at a time. That and I could rotate the board. A ring of grips around the outside of the board, 
allowed the player to turn the table as the ball fell, giving the control that every Pachinko player has desired since the beginning of time. The troughs the balls fell into also turned with the board, and to make it even easier, there were multiple holes it could enter, like ski ball for different point values. Admittedly, the null point hull had a larger trough than any of the others, but it was still frightfully easy to navigate the Fushinko ball where I wanted. I guess the board might have been a bit heavy and cumbersome to someone with significantly less upper body strength, which may or may not have been the reason I chose it. That smug grin quickly faltered when the ski sack all-star learned that her tail just didn't cut it as far as leverage was concerned when pitted against my inferior throwing appendages. You're kind of a sore loser, you know that? Now it was my turn to have the cheering crowd behind me, while Yava struggled and, might I add, failed to catch up to me, all the while listening to her group grow sullen and quiet. Ah, sweet, sweet revengeance. I was halfway to doubling my already sizable ski sack fortune, when my machine abruptly powered down. Actually, it wasn't just my machine, it was all of them in the row. Stickman seemed distant as he listened to something I couldn't hear, then rushed up to us, his hands spread wide. My sincerest apologies, but we seem to be having technical difficulties with these games at the moment. Perhaps you would like to try your luck at some of the other tables. Technical difficulties? The other's eyes narrowed. You sure it has nothing to do with the fact that we've both set record high scores for both these games, our first time trying them? Stickman looked outright offended, which kind of made me suspicious as he rarely looked outright anything at any given time. I assure you, Hedonist does not employ such underhanded tricks. I was told there were technical difficulties, so I promise that is the truth. Now, as to trying other games, I would be happy to set you up, and with the wealth you have already amassed, it would be simple to prepare one of the higher stakes games should you desire. Actually, I interjected, we should probably check in with our other business venture. I don't exactly have the time, and we wouldn't want to be late. Now I knew something was up, because I could actually see a shadow of sullenness flit across Stickman's demeanour. Very well, he droned. Follow me. Wait, you know why we're here? Obviously, was all he deigned to reply. Not bothering to see if we were following, Stigman turned, heading towards the centre line of the ship. After several minutes of walking, I could tell that we were actually heading for the far wall, and after another several long minutes of walking, I could even deduce which building. Every building ahead of this had its own unique architecture, to the point I almost felt obligated to give each and every one a name. Had I named the building we entered behind Stigman, I probably would have called it Black Needle or something similarly lame. Look, if I was naming every building in the entire ship, then by that time I got to this one, I would have run out of original ideas. Inside the elevator, Stingman placed his hand on a nondescript part of the wall, looked sternly at another blank section, and held that pose for several seconds. I was about to ask him if everything was okay when the elevator started moving without any voice commands having been given. We had started on the ground floor, so wherever we were going was near the top, because the elevator felt fast, but we kept climbing for nearly a minute. When we finally stopped, Stigman allowed, for the first time, Iava to take the lead, although he kept closely instead with me. The elevator doors had opened up onto a long, dimly lit hallway. A couple sharp turns and we were confronted by a heavy door guarded by a stocky looking white giraffe. Well, stocky as far as white giraffes go. You realise they're called... Do you honestly expect me to try pronouncing that? And since when I have ever called anything by its real name except Yava, hell, sometimes I still call her a rat. In fact, I'm sure she would find quite interesting were I to reveal it to her. Don't you dare. Just kidding. That's what I thought. The heavy looking doors opened. I'd been so preoccupied with the traitor inside my head, I hadn't even noticed as Yava handed the white giraffe a small data chip, which he probably shoved into a small apparatus on one of his wrists, before stepping out of the way to let us pass. I don't know why, but I had kind of assumed that the room beyond the doors would have matched with what I had thought all prize fighting rings looked like. Dirty, dimly lit, kind of dusty, reeking of sweat and probably blood. Because that's how they always looked in the movies. One day I'll learn that expecting everything to look like it did in the movies will leave me sorely disappointed. The ring and stands looked exactly like you could expect them to look, in a place as classy as the hedonist. Large, comfortable seats with enough armrests and elbow room for everyone, regardless of their anatomy. Lighting, perfectly highlighting the ring, while still allowing the spectators to see their own hands in front of their eyes. And dim screens, unobtrusively placed to allow spectators easy access to a bookie. I turned to Stickman. So, do we need to register somewhere, or is there a, some kind of waiting room? He looked at me incredulously, his professional manner crackling. 
This really is your first torso match, isn't it? I know you humans are supposed to be stocky, and from what I've seen, that seems to be more than likely. But I had heard better things about your employer. He shook himself. Yes, there is a waiting room for fighters and their handlers, just down that hallway. He gestured to a door on our left. You've already been registered, but you'll still need to be in that room when the tournament starts, which will be in a bit. I thought they were joking, but it seems your employer really did want me to explain the rules of the match. They're simple. A fighter is disqualified when they are either unconscious, dead, or thrown from the ring. No weapons allowed. Great, I clapped. So tell me again why you're still here. He sighed. In what is looking to be an increasingly foolish move on part of your employer, she plays several small bets in your favour. I'm here to witness and facilitate the transfers in her stead, once the tournament is complete. I didn't really have a reply to that, so instead I just nodded disinterestingly, then followed Yara to the waiting room door. I hadn't even made it past the threshold when a quiet alarm went off right inside the waiting room. I looked up expecting to see something exclaiming I was the 1000th customer, but instead was greeted by a haggard looking courty as he bustled out from a side room. Huh. So much for a vagno statement that I'd never find a courty here. Prosthetic? He added in a bored voice. Um, yes? This way. He gestured for us to follow. The room he led us to was a rather impressively stocked and equipped medical bay, complete with scanner, which he probably had me lay upon. I tried to set up to get a clear look at what he was doing, but at an annoyed growl, I say flatten the scanner. When he let me up, I looked down at my left leg and found the entire prosthetic had been removed, replaced instead by a simple metal strut, locked into the socket that had previously held a working robotic leg. So you're going to tell me what this is about or what? He gave me a flat look, so he gave me the look that all courty learn in the womb. You honestly didn't think you'd be competing with cybernetic enhancements, did you? These are strength and endurance tests, not who has the deepest account contests. You couldn't just give me a leg that matched my current biological one strength? Not in the time we have. I'm surprised you even managed to get into this tournament on such short notice, let alone acquire a cybernetics waiver. You must have some pretty powerful backers to be able to get into this match so late. Apparently done with the conversation, Peggy turned and walked away. Peggy? Yeah, he gave me a peg leg and took my real one, so Peggy. You really need to work on your names. Hey, I didn't even have a real one this time, and he spoke for less than a minute. You can't expect me to come up with a masterpiece with so little information. With Peggy gone, we walked into the common area, where another attendant checked our names and showed us to a small room with some equipment I didn't recognise. So you going to be okay? Yara screeched once we were alone. I think, I said, trying not to show how the simple appendage was getting to me. I didn't need anything fancy, but an ankle and a knee would have been nice. At least it supported weight. I suppose it was great for pivoting. You think Vagno knew? I grimaced. Yeah, she usually knows everything I can spot. This answers any questions based on your previous assumptions. Um, I suppose this could be why she picked such a low-key target. I mean, there are still people here whose opinions matter, but if you fail, it wouldn't really ruin her. Just be a minor setback, really. For her bigger clients, she could probably play it off as an inconsequential venture she didn't really care about. Also, I guess that if you were to fail, you'd fail before you had to fight Uxir, so your defeat wouldn't add to her ex-client's prestige. Great, I monotoned. But she wasn't finished. And, I'm guessing if you did lose to Uxir, she could use that as leverage for extra favours, if she played it right. But if you do win, it would humiliate her ex-client even more because you're so obviously handicapped. Really, she could probably make it so she'll win either way. Perfect. Well, no use worrying about it until the actual fight starts. Any pointers? Huh? I smiled. Well, you are my handler, so you're supposed to say something. I won't listen to it, but I'd like you to know that I value your input. She stuck her tongue out at me, which, funnily enough, was her version of the middle finger, but then grew serious for one of the first times since boarding Hedonist. Actually, I do have a request, or rather a challenge, if you want it. Intrigued, I shrugged. Sure, shoot. Try winning without hurting anyone. I was somewhat taken aback. Oh, um, okay, you do realise I'm working with a peg like here, right? I know, she was talking quickly, and if you can't win without it, then forget it, but I have a hunch you'll manage even with the handicap, and if I'm right, do you think you could at least try? I thought a moment. I mean, what was there to lose from trying? Who knows, maybe it'd even be fun. She's trying to help you, numbskull. What? You asked her to help keep you in check, that's what she's doing. Say yes and stick to it, even if it means losing. You sure? Just do it. Fine. Sure, I'll do it. But if I win, then when we get back to the ship, we make another game called Checkers, and you have to play that until I say we're done. 
She smiled. Deal. The first match went out, one I wasn't a part of, and I decided my remaining time was best spent acclimating myself to my newest appendage. I was hobbling around at a city pace when they finally called my name. Iava in tow, we exited the waiting area and back into the arena. Shadowy figures lined the walls, none distinct enough to tell what species they could be, yet I could still hear their hushed voices as we walked to the ring. Well, I guess neither of us was really walking. Iava hopped, I hobbled. Maybe I was just imagining it, but there seemed to be a definite uptick in conversation upon our entrance. Maybe it was because of my leg, or maybe because of, you know, human and all that. Probably a bit of both. My opponent was already waiting for me, an ant lizard. Robolin. Whatever. Whose name I'm sure the announcer had yelled, but I haven't bothered to catch. To me, he was Scrappy, which as fate would have it, was not only his name, but also his main quality, although I didn't know it yet. I clambered into the ring. It's not so easy with a peg for a leg. Okay. Stood up, and then, because it seemed the right thing to do, stuck my hand out to my opponent. You know, I probably should have thought about it before doing it, because Scrappy and the troll. Locale. Ref went apeshit the moment I did that. Scrappy jumped back, all three arms going up, while the ref quickly imposed himself between us. I have to give that guy credit. From the jumpy way he kept himself between us, it looked like he knew at least what I was. So, you know, props to him for still jumping in between us. Whoa there, sorry, old custom. Didn't mean to startle anyone. The ref, now flustered. Sheesh man, don't let him see you sweat. Shouted at me entirely too loudly considering the indoor setting. The contestants will remain at either side of the ring until the match begins, is that understood? Yeah, sure. Like I said, my bad. Carry on. As I returned to my side of the ring, I heard Yava mutter behind me from just outside the ring. Was this old custom you speak of? Because it looked a little on the aggressive side. I glanced back to see she was smiling. I knew she would be because her people had a similar custom that used the tail rather than the dominant hand, with nearly identical origins for why people shook hands. The ref clicked something in his hand and a loud buzzer sounded. I guess that was the signal for the match to begin because Scrappy started doing this weird shuffle at me, hands up, keeping I guess what he thought was a safe distance. He had reach on me, I mean most beans out here technically have that on me, and I guess Scrappy was hoping he could use that to his advantage. Poor brave little fool. Remember, no hurting anyone. Right, that, fine. Taking a step of my peg, I stumbled a little. At least it probably looked like I did, because Scrappy took the opportunity to take a shot at me with two of his arms, keeping the third up in defence. I was actually impressed. I fought a shipload of ant lizards. Why? Before in this guy was pretty fast comparatively, but I kind of spent the last decade and a half of my life fighting meter-high rodents who put most humans to shame in the speed department, and old habits died hard. I had enough time to grab for his arms, miss because they were coming in too slow, and then grab at them again. I nailed them on the second pass and used them like a rope to pull him closer to me. Gently, mind you, didn't want to hurt him, but still forcefully. He came in with the third arm, which I saw no reason to block. It hit, then hit again. I mean, maybe it made him feel better. I was out to keep from hurting him, and just maybe that extended to hurting his feelings, so I thought I might as well cover all my bases and let him feel like his wasn't doing too poorly. So in the interest of not hurting his feelings, I decided ending it sooner rather than later was probably the better course of action. Once he was close enough, I let go of his arms. He tried to reel back, but I grabbed him around the waist and, still gently mind, slung him over my shoulder. I took a knee to the face, a foot to the gut, and two arms to my back and one to my kidney, but it was like I was fighting an energetic younger sibling. They stung for a moment, which honestly I was surprised at, but the net result was he just made it harder for me to balance on this idiotic peg. You know, I grunted, as I made my unsteady way towards the edge of the ring. You could just make this easy on the both of us by... The knee came in again and hit me in the mouth. I tasted blood that wasn't mine. Okay, now that's just not fair. I can't keep from hurting you if you hurt yourself on me. I turned to Yava. I swear that wasn't me. You saw that, he hit me hard enough to break his skin, right? That doesn't count, does it? For some reason, she didn't seem to be able to answer. Instead, it looked like she was doing everything in her power to keep from laughing. I had no idea why, this was serious. I was in it to win her challenge, and here I was, first round about to possibly lose on a technicality. I had to finish this quickly before he broke an arm on me or something. As I reached the edge of the ring, he struggling became more intense. Oh, hush, I snapped. If I lose because of you, then you're getting off easy. Lifting gently, I deposited him on the other side of the ring. He tried to use the ropes to scramble back over, but I pried him off and gave him a little toss. I wish I'd been able to place him far enough, but like I said, he had the reach on me. The moment he hit the floor outside the ring, another buzzer went off. 
I didn't like the way Scrappy landed for my throw, but a moment later he got up. And yes, he did not have a limp. Whew, close one there. I looked triumphantly at Yalva. She gave me a weak thumbs up. Was she crying? She looked like she almost wanted to. Sheesh, some people just can't handle losing. You're not this thick, so why do you insist on acting like it? Because it's fun. I tossed Scrappy, carefully, off the side opposite where I needed to exit, and as I passed the ref, he backed away from me like I was going to attack him for just being too close. Honestly, if he kept acting like that, I might start considering it. If you hurt him, that still counts against the challenge. Shit, you're right. Fine, racist ref was off the hook too. Pretty sure that's speciest, and I mean, you were just contemplating attacking him. Hush. Eova. It had been the right decision to ask Selvin to try and keep from hurting any of his opponents. Firstly, because it was the right thing to do, and secondly, because it was far more entertaining to watch a being whom for so long she had thought only capable of killing try desperately to not kill beings that, now she had saw them fight, really did look like they had had a talent for dying. The first fight had only been a teaser to what would follow. The very next fight, Selvin's opponent, apparently having seen what had happened to their predecessor, tried to fight by running past him and hitting low. They were too slow, but when Selvin tried placing them outside the ring, they instead clawed at his eyes and managed to get themselves dropped. They would have hit the floor at an awkward angle had Selvin not shrieked in dismay and dived, catching his opponent at the last moment and carefully putting him back on his feet. After that, Selvin seemed to think the best way to keep his opponent from hurting themselves was by carefully petting them. The position looked awkward for Selvin, but it kept the strange creatures immobilized without crushing anything. They then had a lengthy and hushed conversation before the Bean finally agreed that it was best if they just conceded, which was apparently a first in many years judging by the shock on the official's face. It was strange, she thought, having an official for a fight with so few rules. The next contestant didn't even try to fight. They just ran around trying to keep away from Selvin, who was jogging softly behind, trying hard to keep from running into his frantic competition. Although I was shouting that they couldn't they just be reasonable and see it was just far better to turn and fight than keep running. When Selvin finally cornered his opponent, the poor thing collapsed, not even bothering to contest it, as Selvin gingerly situated him outside the ring. Three fights away from the final, when it looked like no one would even put up anything other than a token resistance. She was nearly relieved when, in the quarterfinals, Selvin's opponent, a beam with powerful hind legs, held herself into the metal strut they had supplied him in lieu of a leg, toppling him. The moment he fell, the opponent attacked with a flurry of blows, all of which Selvin bore. Every time he attempted to rise, the beam flew at his bad leg, keeping him down. From her excellent view, she could see Selvin getting frustrated, and she wondered if he might go back on her challenge. On a hunch, the next time he went down, she moved around the ring until he could see her face, then she cuddled up the smuggest smile she had, holding that expression until she was sure he had seen it. She knew he had when his face turned a brilliant shade of red. He heard a roar and heaved, grabbing his opponent about the middle and lifting them above his head. Still yelling, he slowly lowered them to the ground, carefully keeping the contestant on their back despite their struggles. But they weren't going out that easily, and Selwyn discovered this as he tried to lower them. He couldn't do it while ensuring his charge's well-being, as every time he moved them away from his body, they found the leverage to kick his leg again. After several failed attempts, he resorted to lifting the ropes off the ring and sliding his opponent, still on their back, under them. As yet another opponent was settled outside the ring, the crowd quietened into the moody silence they usually held while Selvin fought. Apparently, they weren't here to watch a human exercise care and caution against his opponents. They could grumble all they wanted. She'd seen enough blood to fill a lifetime and Selvin probably more. To her, the only passable fights here were Selvin's. She'd seen a few after his first and they were what the crowd had wanted, leaving the loser and often the winner too, oozing blood and held away by doctors or on a stretcher. After those, she'd stopped watching, instead joining Selvin in their waiting room. Two fights left? Selvin spoke into the silence of the waiting room as they waited to be called out for the semi-finals. And then I win. She heard a smile at his smug tone. That's nothing, she replied. Every fight's been child's play so far. So opponents with little to no strength or idea how to fight. It's easy to win without force when the opponents don't have any of their own. He looked at her incredulously. Oh yeah? What makes you think the next two will be any different? I actually saw the one you're about to fight. He's a gal something or another. I can't quite recall, but the announcer claimed his species hasn't agreed to be part of the Dominion yet. My best guess is that means you haven't fought one of his species before. I have to admit, he laughed dryly. I can't recall ever fighting a gal something or another. But I saw him fight, she continued, trying to keep her voice light. His opponent went down in the first round, the gal whatever didn't have a scratch. Huh, 
Selvin picked at her hangnail distractedly. Maybe this will be interesting then. She felt the first flushing of worry. Was this really the best way to do this? I bet you won't stand a chance against him unless you renege on my challenge. That got his attention. He stopped his picking to look at her. Oh, really? Well then, I suppose you wouldn't mind upping the ante then. She paused, confused. Selvin sighed. Make the rewards larger? What did you have in mind? She struggled to keep her excitement in check. Not only do you have to play checkers if I win, but I also get a free pass on ten chess games. Free. Ten. I'm not going down. Well, that was a lie because she wasn't accepting ten. Five. Ten. Seven. Eight. Deal. They shook, tail to hand, as she stifled a sigh. As far as she was concerned, they'd both gotten what they wanted. Selvam had the hope of skipping upcoming chess games, and she had increased assurance he wouldn't hurt the next contestant. It was odd, she reflected, how so few beans out here had fur. Even Selvam only had the odd patches on his head and face. Was it so outrageous, then, that she'd feel somewhat more protective of the gal whatever? And it obviously wasn't just because the creature had her fur. In fact, the first thing that had struck her when she saw it had been the eerily familiar face. Different posture, different colourings, but a face type she hadn't seen in far too long. A little wider, she guessed, but still. And yet, if she thought for a moment it wasn't even due to appearance. It probably helped, but it was the way the bean had looked about before the fight began that had caught her eye. Every other contestant she'd seen had shown fear, excitement, hatred, or a mixture of the three. The Gao? Oin? Owen, Ion, Ian, Gowian, that sounded right, hadn't shown any of these things. The only emotion she'd seen on theirs as they looked around at the spectators surrounding them had been disgust. Okay, probably a little anger too, but it hadn't been directed at the opponent like it had in every other instance she'd seen it. It too had been directed at the spectators, as though the Gowian had been angry they were even there. Or perhaps that he, she was there, as though they didn't want to fight. She didn't like the line of reasoning her mind was currently presenting to her. Should she ask the question now? No, now is a bad time. Later, though. For now it was enough that the Gowian was safe. Still, no harm in making sure. But if I win, she spoke after a moment, and you hurt the Gowian, you have to play chess whenever I say and defer to my judgement whenever we're off ship. Holy shit, how is that even remotely fair? I mean, I don't even know where to begin bargaining that down. Start high, so the happy medium is exactly where you want. He smiled. Eight games any time you please, and during those games I'll call you Commander. Lobel much? We're going to be here a while, aren't we? Only until we're called out. By the time we were called, she bunged it up to 15 games, and I had to call her Commander during the game and the rest of the day as well. Believe me, I fought that last one, but she was unusually adamant. Well, I don't know if I should say unusually. She's got this really annoying adamant streak. Probably for the best, else I doubt we'd have gotten off her planet in such good shape. Define good. At this point I consider good to be synonymous with alive. Then yeah, you got off that planet in great shape. I sent sarcasm. Come now, would I do that? Is this a trick question? What is rhetorical for most probably comes across as a trick to you. Wait, is that my opponent? Well, as they're currently walking to the same ring as you, I'd say that's a safe assumption. But it's... Cute. I was going to make fun of you, but you're right, that's pretty adorable. It's... it's a raccoon. A fluffy raccoon standing on two legs. And look, it's got tiny suspenders on too. Selvim, you okay? Put your hands down. What? You put your fists up over your mouth, take them down, the other's noticing. I can't help it, it's so fluffy. Can't help what? The other interrupted again. I can't do this, I can't fight that, I want to pet it. What? Oh, come on. Don't tell me that you don't look at that and just want to touch it. She looked at me strangely. Um, well, I've got fur too, so it really wouldn't be that much of a novelty. You don't have fur. It's all hair. Coarse and shit. No good for petting. She looked a little offended. You think? It too is fur. Here, touch it. I'm not touching your head. She took a side jump at me, throwing her head in my hand, whispering angrily. Touch it. Tell me it's coarse. No. I put my hands above my head. You can't make me. You realise she can jump that. She leapt into the air, headbutting my raised hands. Hi. Thanks for the... Whoa. Holy shit, it is fur. See? Yeah, wow, that's actually really soft. Told you, she said smugly. Okay, now stop touching my head. You can't just give me something soft and take it away. I can when the soft thing's me. 
Besides, you have another soft thing waiting to fight you. Fine. Maybe he'll let me pet him. She looked closer at my opponent. How do you know it's a he? I don't, I admit it. I'm a guy, so until proven otherwise, I call everything he. That's had to cause a lot of embarrassing situations. I thought a moment. Not really. The key is to be impervious to shame. Uh-huh. Touchy subject. Oh, shit, right. Deciding it was best to end the conversation before it got any worse, and I had to actually put my key notion to the test, I slid under the ropes and entered the ring. Why suspenders? I'm so sorry to ask this, I began. But what are... The buzzer went off. The bean I'd just been about to ask what he was called, since all I knew right now was that it probably started with Gal, flew at my head with a speed that left no time for thought. Fortunately, I'm faster when I'm not thinking. Reactions took over and I caught him mid-dive, using his momentum to move him around me. I was about to slam him into the ground before rational thought took over. Cursing, I tried to stop. I was too far through the throw and instead had to settle for flinging him to the side, so he had the chance to roll off the momentum. I breathed a sigh of relief when he did, and I cautiously approached. As I crept closer, I saw, with a sense of mounting dread, that he wasn't moving. Are you okay? I shouted over the spectators. This was the most noise they'd ever made during one of my fights. Not if you're okay. I have to know before. The little fuck being playing dead. Apparently I'd gotten too close because the prone figure on the ground was suddenly at my neck. Claws I hadn't seen before drew lines of fire across my head and upper chest as I desperately tried to get my hands between me and him. Ow, you, you seem fine. Fuck, look, I don't... Shit, ow! Want to hurt you. Ow, stop it. But if you keep... Fuck, fine. I felt the blood starting to drip from my tortured face as I aimed a half-hearted punch at his side, attempting to dislodge him without seriously injuring him. He granted, but dug in and held on. Continuing the moment, I didn't follow up. Shit, this guy was stronger than most out here. You're not making this easy. I dropped, throwing myself face first into the ground. He wisely decided to jump ship before I landed, but I didn't think that meant he was done with me. Trusting instinct, I rolled in the direction he jumped, flinging an arm out in the direction I guess he'd come from. I was partially correct, and I felt my forearm connect with something fluffy. So soft. Looking up, I could see I connected with his left shoulder, since that was the one that he was holding when he got up. Shit, was it dislocated? Come on, he seemed so durable. I can't exactly pull punches that I'm making blind. You have to better than that. Think of something. But I'm not good at thinking. You don't find up to this point, now think. Wait, was that... encouraging? Shut up and think, you moron. And duck. I ducked, putting my arms up to cover my face. I moved to the other side of the ring, giving myself distance. He was too fast for me to block without putting some force of my own into the booze, and too strong for me to gently place him outside of the ring, and yet still too weak for me to go all on out. Fuck this guy, I don't care how adorable he is, fuck him for being the perfect combination of durable and cardboard that he's almost guaranteed to get hurt if I was going to win this. He came at my face again, and I ducked again, avoiding closing to keep what was left of my face intact. That, and if I closed again, I didn't think he had enough strength left in that shoulder to throw himself clear of me, when I inevitably had to face up to dislodge him. Wait, what if... Oh, look, you can think. Hey, ref, I shouted, as I ducked and rolled, letting the flying fluffy go over me as I popped up and ran back to the other side of the ring. The locale looked either shocked or scared that I was yelling at him mid-game, maybe both, but I got his attention nonetheless. The match is over when one of us touches the ground outside the ring, right? I had to stop talking for a moment as Flying Fluffy came around once more. This time I faked left and broke right. As long as you don't touch the ground, you're not disqualified? Yes, why? And the match ends the moment someone touches the ground. Yes. Good, I grunted to myself. Please work. Okay, I know I said you need to think, but I don't know if you can pull this one off. It'll work. And if it doesn't, you'll have failed the challenge as a spectator and bloody way. It'll work okay, where's that encouragement you had for me a little bit ago? If you're going to go for it, here's your chance, he's coming around again. He was, and this time I let him close. As he came for my face again, I charged, catching him around the middle and holding him out at arm's length while running as fast as I could with a peg leg for the edge of the ring. My forearms, scratched up from when I'd used to block a previous onslaught, registered new injury as he clawed at them, tearing at the already bloody skin. His eyes widened once he saw where I was going and his clawing became more frantic but I held on, charging for the edge. He tried desperately to pry my hands off to the point of biting my hand, which by the way, really fucking hurt. It was all for naught as I flung myself over the ropes and out of the ring, held him at an arm's length in front of me. Just before he hit the ground, I propelled him lightly ahead of me with my wrists, ensuring that he hit first before my hand slammed into the ground on either side of his head, and I tumbled over him. At least I was supposed to roll, but the ring was a little higher up than I thought, 
and I ended up doing a clumsy handstand which quickly overbalanced into me landing heavily on my back. It didn't matter that it hurt. I hadn't landed on Fluffy, and I was sure he'd hit the ground first. I turned over slowly, groaning as my back made known his discomfort. Fluffy finally came to view. I nudged him. Hey man, you good? I panted. Could you do me a solid and get up and look okay? Say something? He opened his eyes. It was a start, but I think if he was carried away on a stretcher, that'd still mean I'd lost. I almost cheered when he finally flipped himself over and started to rise. He noticed my non-verbal encouragement. Okay, there was some verbal too, and glared. You're not helping. I know, I'm sorry. I'd help you up, but I think she'd count this as cheating. I need you to be able to get up on your own. She? Yeah, the little fucker over there. I pointed at Yava, watching intently from across the room. Think you could wave to her and give her a thumbs up? Why? Pretend she's counting on it, and it'll really help me out. His glare deepened. Yeah, well, I also have someone counting on me, and because of you, I just failed them. He spun around and stalked away. Wow, what a dick. Fluffy and adorable, but still a dick. Forget him. I walked over to Yava. She gave me a quick look up and down. You're a mess. You should have seen the other guy. No, wait. She chuckled, then grew serious. What did he say? I couldn't quite make it out. You heard that he said something from over there? Giving me a flat look, she gestured to her massive ears with her tail. Oh, right. Like dinner plates. Nothing much. Just that he felt incredible and so full of energy he needed to go dance a jig or something similar. I don't know what weird dances they do out here. The look grew flatter somehow. Fine. I repeated what he said. See? Nothing. Just a dick being dickish. Can we go back to the waiting room? Blood's about to get into my eyes. Sure, she said distractedly. Uh, go ahead without me. I want to watch the next fight. It's Uix's semi-finals. Suit yourself. I turned and limped, because of the peg leg, and because I was in enough pain that limping felt right, back to the waiting room. Waiting alone was boring. After cleaning my scratches, some of which were deeper than I'd have liked, I had nothing to do but sit around and twiddle my thumbs. I didn't make it past the third twiddle before I was bored. As I moved to leave the waiting room to join Yava, the heads up guy stuck his head through the door. Five minutes. I stared at him in shock. What? But the fight should have just started. And it just ended. Five minutes. I noted my understanding and returned to where I'd been sitting, assuming Yava would soon be in. She wasn't. Five minutes came and went. Heads up called me out and she still hadn't shown. I guess she was outside. Exiting the waiting area into the arena, I looked around. She wasn't waiting for me by the ring, maybe the sands? Nope. No Yava's sightseeing there. Okay, seriously, where the fuck was she? You don't exactly have time to search. Uex is waiting for you. Yes, I can see that, but she'll miss what I've been planning for this fight. Well, she can't say you hurt him if she wasn't here to witness it. But I wasn't planning on hurting him. I know that, and I so expect you to stick to it, but I'm just pointing out that she can't claim you hurt him when she wasn't here to see it. True. And fine, I'll beat you Ixa, then we'll find her. She couldn't have gone too far. Mentally turning away from the internal conversation, I took my first real look at the reason I was even here in the first place. He was... smaller than I'd expected. I mean, he was still taller than me, but all the trolls. Holy fuck, can you just say local? I like that. But standing next to the ref, you could see that for his species he was small, just over two meters. Short maybe, but that didn't mean he didn't look dangerous. Short really didn't do him justice. Starkey would have been a better term. Thick arms and legs accentuated his stature until I felt we were nearly of the same height, despite him being slightly more than a half metre taller. He was certainly wider than me. I didn't doubt all of that was muscle. The scariest part about him was how he stood, or perhaps a better term would be idled. He had just fought through a supposedly exhausting gauntlet of fights, yet I couldn't see a scratch on him. Hell, even I was covered in scratches, several of which I felt I'd be lucky if they healed without scarring. Nah, who am I kidding? With the amount of attention I'd be giving them, I'd be lucky to avoid infection. Most frightening of all was the energy he seemed to be exuding from every pore. The exuberance displayed by his pre-fight warm-up put most of my previous opponents during fight routines to shame. The scene before me was not something I was accustomed to out here. But where the fuck was Yalva? Win first. Questions later. Fine. Putting all thoughts of her out of my mind, I pulled myself into the ring. Upon my entrance, Uxia ceased his hopping about, turned, and settled into a loose ready position. Did he look scared? Most of my other opponents had looked scared. Nope. He looks relaxed, if anything. Great. Maybe he has something up his sleeve, such as it were. Maybe. If I had planned on fighting him like all the rest, I would have encountered the twist that would ultimately have been my undoing. Maybe if I had planned on actually trying to make this fight look like anything other than a clown fest, 
would have been shocked by Yuxi's martial prowess. Thankfully, my instructions have been to humiliate my opponent. Buddy, I'm sorry. The buzzer sounded, signalling the beginning of the fight. Right from the gate, Yuxi showed he was a different level of skilled. Instead of charging me in a headlong rush like the other few opponents who'd actually tried to beat me, he waited, circling, watching. I wasn't about that life. Strolling jauntily across the ring, I approached him at a leisurely pace, trying my hardest to appear nonchalant about the whole ordeal. Does that work? Can you try your hardest to look like you're not trying your hardest? He had longer arms than me. The moment I was within his reach, he struck, all four arms whirling into motion, two attempting to grab while the other two attempted to strike. I dodged every attack save one. I wasn't watching close enough. I wonder the punching arms now be in the chest. That actually hurt a bit. Well, I'll be. Now, I was glad I hadn't gone the idea of just letting him hammer away at me until he collapsed of exhaustion. I didn't think I'd be able to take a massive number of hits like that. Quite a few to be certain, but this guy actually had a bit of a kick to him. To a point, when someone has as many arms as that guy, and they're so obviously well practiced at using them together without getting them all tangled up, there's not a lot a guy can do in regards to dodging every individual attack. I suppose I could have activated tryhard mode and dodged like I did back at the Rat Planet. Dracus, you moron. Why should I bother remembering these pointless names when you do it for me? But I was here to embarrass the shit out of this guy. Very rarely did anyone ever feel ashamed when the person who beat them had to so obviously work hard to win. This guy was better than I thought he would be, and I could now see that my plan of dodging him until he collapsed from exhaustion would require visible effort on my part. What if? No. Why not is a tried and true method, because that breaks your promise. No it doesn't, not technically. Did you... Just glare at me? Glad I got the message across. I'm impressed, but come on. I'm not going to play keep away from this guy for as long as it takes him to get tired. I need something else, and I think I could pull this off. Probably, but think of your dignity. My what? Forget it. How are you sure it won't hurt him? I'll be careful. Fine, but watch the lower arms. He may attempt to overbalance you, and try to use the peg leg as little as possible. Were I him, that'd be the first place I'd strike to dislodge you. Noted. During our conversation, I avoided two more of his attempts to close, and was currently on the other side of the ring from him. As I returned my full attention to the fight, I saw his weight shift, signalling another attempt. Right on cue, he attacked. Focusing fully, I tracked his two upper arms, ignoring the lower two. My middle quickly registered exactly where those lower two had gone, but I didn't care as I grabbed the wrists of the upper two mid-flight. I couldn't help the shit-eating grin from spreading all over my face as I tightened my grip on those upper arms. For a moment he looked confused, but instead of trying to free his arms, he began to pummel me with the others. That was the price I'd have to pay for what I was about to do. Letting my grin go wider, I applied a considerable amount of force to his captured arms, turning them back on himself, running both of them simultaneously into his jaw. The crowd became deathly silent as his upper arms impacted his face. His eyes widened, his three appendages freezing mid-strike. Into the shocked stillness, I yelled the sacred battle cry. Stop hitting yourself! I struck him again in the face with his fists. Stop hitting yourself. Again, harder. I said, stop hitting yourself. As I forced his arms to strike for the fourth time, he started resisting, trying foolishly to wrest his arms away from me as his lower appendages once again began their assault. Pouring my effort into powering through his surprisingly decent resistance and ignoring the protest from my ribcage, I continued to throw his hands into his face, chanting my mantra loud with each hit, pouring as much concern into my voice as possible. As it became clear that his upper arms had insufficient strength to free themselves unaided, he abandoned his attack on my stomach and grabbed my forearms with his lower two, pulling down as their trapped brethren yanked up. With some difficulty I maintained my grip. He was strong, but not enough to keep me from slowly bringing his upper arms once again into contact with his sweating jowl. It was more of a love tap than anything. Upon its soft impact he flew into a rage. With a roar he redoubled his efforts, tearing savagely at my arms, trying to dislodge me. His legs also entered the fray. Just as he'd warned me, Uxir went for the peg leg, trying to trip me. I was ready for it and maintained my balance, using his arms to steady me, leaning into him and using that to overpower his resistance. He relaxed his upper fist to dull the impact, but I continued mashing his limp hands into his cheeks, now screaming in his face, Come on, man, I'm begging you, stop hitting yourself! Furiously, he aimed another kick at my peg leg. It was a little too furious, because when I leaned into him, he overbalanced, falling onto his back. Bending at the waist, I held on, continuing my attack when he landed. Seeing my chance, I started dragging him towards the edge. Every time he tried to regain his feet, I pulled, yanking him back down, then smacked him with his hands a couple times for good measure. It helped that he was still attempting to dislodge me, giving me excellent leverage. I was breathing heavily as we neared the edge, and if anything, his lunging attempts had only grown stronger. 
Stop fighting me, dude. I'm trying to help you, I shouted. You need to stop hitting yourself. He roared something I couldn't make out, so I interpreted it as his undying thanks for all I was doing for him. It took a good two minutes of intense grunting and sweating to scoot him under the ropes and over the edge. Thirty seconds in, I had to stop offering helpful advice so I could breathe. When his weight finally worked against him and he tipped over the edge, I extricated myself from his grip, sitting down exhausted. His breath was coming out even faster than mine as he lay motionless outside the ring. Something about the eye still spoke of unbelieving shock. I couldn't blame him. He beat himself up pretty soundly during the fight. The crowd was completely silent. From the looks on their faces, they still couldn't believe it either. I shot a quick glance at the ref to make sure I had really won, since I hadn't heard the end buzzer yet. My glance seemed to shake him from a trance, and he looked about, confused. Glancing down at his hand, he saw the buzzer button. After staring at it for several long seconds, he pressed it. Noting my thanks to the sound, I slowly stood, exited the ring, and left the arena, making my way to get my real fake leg attached. For some reason, Peggy the prosthetic thief was throwing a half smile the whole time he reattached my leg. For a courty, he might as well have been doubled over in laughter. Stickman met me outside the medical room. I knew he had washed, but his face gave away nothing of what he thought of the spectacle I had wrought. Your handler asked me to inform you that she regrets her absence, but that she was sure you would be able to handle business without her, and that she'd meet with you the moment she had completed her business. Business? I asked, wiping sweat from my eyes. What business? She didn't say, he replied. Fine, I said. Not worried at all. Nope, not one bit. I guess away for her back at our rooms. Uh, I don't exactly remember where they are. Stigman led the way out of the arena, down the building, through the massive garden that was the majority of the interior of Hedonist, and back to the exquisite rooms we had so briefly visited what felt like days before. Upon my entering, I promptly collapsed into one of the two beds, not bothering to check if I was still bleeding from Fluffy's cuts, or caring that I was still sweaty. I was peacefully snoring in seconds. Wake up. Something's wrong. Wake up. Hmm? Wake up. My eyes opened blearily. What? The other's not back. It's been several hours. Well, we can wait several more hours. I closed my eyes again. No, we can't. We should go looking for her. I'm tired. I don't care how you feel. Something's wrong. I know it. How can you be worried when I'm not? Ask that when literally our only friend isn't in trouble. Okay, then. How do you know she's in trouble? This is her first time around people in, like, eight months, and then she just leaves without supervision? Do you honestly think she isn't in trouble right now? Fuck, good point. Fine, I'll get up. Can I shower first? No, not enough time. Grumbling in protest, I staggered to my feet. Figuring the best place to start looking was the ship in case she'd returned there. I started towards the docking bays, taking my time in remembering where we'd parked. Wish I knew how to get a hold of Stickman. Eh, who needs him? Finally finding the correct bay, I boarded the ship. Eava? I called the moment I was past the airlock doors. You better be in here because I got a worry ward handing my ass to find you. I'm not in the mood to play hide and seek in a ship this big. After several moments of no reply, I walked to her room, hoping to find her sleeping. No luck. With a slight sense of worry, I decided to check the cockpit to be thorough. Poking my head through, I did a quick scan. Saw nothing. Backed out. Then did a double take. Checking again, I saw one of the comlinks flashing, indicating a message. Curious, I sat down, hitting the requisite keys to instigate the playback. Iyawa's face appeared on the screen. Wherever she was, it was complete dark, the only light the glow from whatever device she was using to record and send the message. She smiled nervously. Hey, so I want to say I'm glad you showed me how to do this. Super helpful. She took a deep breath. Funny story, and a long one too, and honestly, I don't know if me sending this message will enable him to find me, or some magical like that. So to keep it short, I'm, uh... She let off a short giggle. That wasn't good. She wasn't a giggle. Okay. I currently may or may not be in the cargo hold of a slavish ship. 